Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right, good. I'm glad to know you're awake and alive out there. Um, thanks for joining us online. Thanks for joining us in person. It's good to have you today. Um, I, I'm excited to get into what we're going to get into. I do want to announce one thing before we do that. Uh, we have baptisms coming up. It's been a year. Yeah, uh, yeah, you can clap for that. I mean, we're excited. Um, it's been a year since we've been able to do this, and so uh, May 2nd, we have baptisms coming up. And so if you, we had a few people who were going to get baptized back in, last March uh, that were all signed up, and then all the shutdowns happened, and the pool was not available for us, and you know, all the craziness of this last year. I think we're all, we all understand what I mean by that. I don't have to like explain, unless you're watching this five years from now, and then you might not know what I'm talking about. But, um, but I'm excited because a lot of you who maybe wanted to get baptized then can now uh, jump in, literally, to the pool and get baptized then uh, on May 2nd. So if, you, if you're just wondering about baptism and you don't want to necessarily commit to getting baptized on the 2nd, but you just want to know more about it, um, go ahead and, and reach out to us. You can, you can email us at getinfo at rapsychurch.com or it's as easy as uh, going to the digital connect card and there's an option on there that uh, says baptism. You can click that and just let us know that you're, you're interested in that. Um, baptism is such an important step in the faith journey. It's, it's all about showing not just our community. It's, I mean, it is. It's showing the community your, that you are all in on Jesus, right? That's what baptism is about. I, I'm saying that, that the old me is, is gone and the new me is here in Christ. And so uh, such an important thing. So please, uh, if you've never been baptized, again, you just have questions about it, please let us know. We, we'd love to be a part of that, uh, that journey with you. So <clears throat> last week, we started um, kind of a new series that we called What If? And the idea behind this series, What If?, is um, it, it, at, at first, we start with this kind of stance towards life, especially when crisis is happening and craziness has happened of like when, when, when tragedy hits, we think we have this, wait, what? You know, we have that, that kind of thought. But the what if is going from that wait what to wait, what if God has something amazing for me in all of this? What, what if this isn't the end of the story? What if there's more to it? What if there's, that there's something I can anticipate that's right around the corner that I'm just not seeing yet? And so that's what this series really is all about. Um, I will say, and I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to just give this disclaimer up front um, today and then probably won't need to give it again, but I, I have this sense that this is a really, number one, really important series because I think what we're doing is we're, we're getting back to the foundation of, of what our faith is built on, which is really important for us to do right now because a lot of our foundations have, have crumbled a bit. Um, a lot of us are, have that sense of, how do I rebuild my life, right? Out of, the, out of the rubble of everything that's happened over this past year, how do I rebuild my life? And so um, we're going to get to a lot of that throughout this series in the next few weeks. Um, and we're going to start today with, with something that's, that's, uh, that's going to be maybe a little hard to hear, but is really important for the foundational piece of, uh, our, well, the foundational piece of our faith. And so we're going to go through some foundation stuff throughout the next four weeks or more. I don't know. We'll see how long it lasts. I could go through the summer. Who knows? Um, I doubt it. But I, I, uh, I, I want to take us on kind of a, a, a journey of understanding where our foundation should be. So to do that, we're going to start in Matthew 7 and verse 24. And this comes at the end of the greatest sermon of all time, the Sermon on the Mount. Um, Jesus is, has just finished teaching his disciples and his followers some of the greatest truths that he's ever relayed when he was on earth. And, uh, and, and I, I think actually we'll probably go back to these, because a lot of these are such foundational truths. And they were such transitional truths, because the, the, the people who were listening, they, they used to think a certain way, and everything Jesus was throwing at them during the Sermon on the Mount was like game-changing truths. These things that, that were like, wait a second. Like, it's a paradigm shift completely. 
um, you, you mean that even if I say I hate my brother, that, 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 that is like murder, right? Like, it's, so it's not just the, he started to, to unroll these truths that were like game changers. And so at the end of all of this, he, he comes to verse 24 of Matthew 7. And it says this, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rain and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike their teachers of religious law. So today we're going to talk about this idea, built to last. Built to last. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we need you today. We need your truth in our lives. We need you as our foundation. and We long to be built to last. So would you help us? Would you break through those stubborn areas of our hearts? And would you help us to build on the proper foundations? We need you in this. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all are real quiet today. Um, don't you love things that are built to last? Like, I think about, um, there's some things that are like that, like craftsman tools, right? Or the Leatherman, what do you, what do you call it? it it's the, 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 the multi-purpose tool, right? I have one. Um, but the Leatherman tool, right? Like, these things are built to last. I think of the Jansport backpack. Because you still have yours, right? You could pass it down to your kids and it would still work. In fact, Jansport still sells backpacks because they're built to last, right? I, 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 think, about, uh, I think about KitchenAid, right? Unless, let me tell you, you buy their can openers. I don't know what I've bought. We, we've had three KitchenAid can openers, and all of them have broken in the first, like, six months. But everything else KitchenAid is built to last, right? KitchenAid's built to last. I think about the Dekine fanny pack. Come on. You all thought it was gone, but they're coming back, right? You think just because they're wearing them around their, you know, around this part now that, that like they're somehow not a fanny pack? It's the same thing, okay? It's still a fanny pack. I saw more fanny packs when we were in Disney World than when I was growing up in the 90s. They are back, and the Dekine fanny pack is built to last, right? These things are built to last the test of time. They, they, they can make it through all the rigors of whatever you're using them for. There's tons of other things that are built to last, and then there's things that aren't so much. And you know these things. You buy them for $5 at Walmart, and they're broken the next day, right? Because you didn't want to spend the money. You didn't want to take the time to get the thing that's going to last. Instead, you wanted kind of the cheap fix right away. That's not part of the sermon, but that might be for free for some of you. Um, so we bought this canopy uh, back in October of last year. And my wife was super, super excited about it. And she's like, we need to build this thing before. Because our, our whole thing is we love our, back, our backyard. Sarah's done an amazing job, has made it super beautiful back there. And, and so we have this, this fire pit area, but we wanted to use it all year round, right? I mean, we want to be out there, rain, snow, it doesn't matter. We want to be out in it. And so we decided we're going to get this, this giant 12 by 12 canopy. And we, and we did. So, so we got it, and Sarah built it. She sent me this picture. I was, I was doing a job. And uh, she sent me this picture. That's Eli under there. You can see him peeking his head around. Him and Eli built this, or her, my wife. Her and Eli built this canopy. 
And, and Sarah told me, this, it was a really sunny day in October, which is very rare. And she said, listen, uh, by the end of the week, I really, really need you to finish up the foundation of this thing. I need you to, uh, to get the, you know, stake it in and get the sandbags down on it. And so I said, no worries, babe, I'll get to it. And then this happened. <laughs> so the wind came, right? And the, the storm came. And there was this, I don't know if you guys remember this, but in, in October, November of last year, there was this giant windstorm that went through. And that was right after we built this thing. And so the windstorm came through, and that's actually a generous picture of it. We didn't get a really good picture of it um, because there's, it, but anyway. Um, but it was demolished. In fact, Caleb had to help me, like, cut the thing apart to even get it so we could get it out of there, right? This thing was destroyed. And, and I want to tell you the reason why it was destroyed was because the foundation wasn't in the ground. It was, it was flimsy. It was ready to break. It, it was like literally once she put the thing up, it was ready to come down. And a lot of us, we think we've put up kind of a, a good canopy in our lives, or we think that, we've, that we have such a great foundation. But the truth is, is when the rain and torrents come, we find out it wasn't quite the foundation that we thought it was. And uh, there's a lot of that happening right now. I, I talk to a lot of people who are struggling with their faith right now who are struggling with just what to do with their lives, just what, like, what the heck do I do now? This, this, this past year, or, or maybe even this year was just the icing on the cake for you. For a lot of people, maybe it wasn't just this past year. Maybe it was, it's been 10 years of just crazy, crazy life where you would, you're coming to the end of it saying, okay, where am I? Like, like what, what, what foundation have I even built my life on? What, what, what are the things that I've built my life on? And so I want us to ask that question today. As we, as we go through the morning, I'm going to ask it several times, and, and I want you, if, if you will, to answer it to yourself. What have I built my life on? Because we all build our lives on different things. We build our lives on either what Jesus would say, as the solid rock, him, his teaching, his words, or we build it on the shaky sand, right? We all know the songs that are behind it, but there's a truth behind it that's deeper than the fun song that was, that, that was made, right? In that there, there is literally a foundation you can either build on a strong foundation, which is Jesus, or you can build on a shaky foundation, which is everything else. Everything else. And the interesting thing about this, when Jesus is teaching, is he said, for those who hear my word, to both of them. Did you notice that? He said, for those who hear my words and live, it, live them out, right, believe, build their life on them, that's like a wise person building their house on a rock. But for those who hear my words, he says it again, but essentially ignore them. Essentially say, well, these aren't really truths I need to live by. This, this is a, Jesus, I mean, I, I know this whole Jesus thing is, is cool, but I don't really like this one thing, or, or maybe this isn't for me, or, or, or whatever, and, and, and so I'm going to build my life on something else. Jesus would say you are like a foolish person, building your house on the sand. And, and so we have, to, we have to get to a foundational point in our faiths. Some, some of you I know really well. Others of you I just met today. Some of you are tuning in for the first time online. Some of you have been tuning on, in for a long time. And you may not like me a whole lot after this message, and I am sorry for that. And it kind of sucks because I really like being liked. It's a thing. But I love you more than simply being liked. I love you enough to tell you that you can build your life on Jesus the solid rock 
or you can build your life on stuff that's going to shake and your life will, will fall apart. It will collapse. And so what do we build our lives on? There's a lot of things. There's a lot of shifting sands that people build on. One of those things is experiences, right? We build our life on experiences. We build our life on even our own experience. So what we've learned in our life, maybe ha- having it been through, through education, or maybe it's just simply things we've gone through. And so things that we've gone through inform how we live our lives or inform how we view our lives. A lot of us, uh, we, we have, we've had good experiences or bad experiences with church. And so we build our lives on those experiences. That's shaky sand. If we build our lives on the things we've experienced, good or bad. In other words, a lot of us as youth, if we grew up in the church, we went to conferences. Has anybody ever been to a youth conference in the room? Or, right, or, or even maybe an adult conference. I don't know, right? They make those too, and they're good. And a lot of, and I did, I did youth ministry for a long time. And a lot of the faith of those kids and those youth was built on their experience in that conference. Now, most of those experiences were good. However, they weren't life. They were a mountaintop experience. They were a, a, a nice thing that they, they walked away with that was important to them. And possibly they even heard stuff that was life-changing. And I don't doubt any of that. But if they base their experience with Jesus on that, it's shaky sand. If you base your life on experiences, it is shaky sand. Instead of, in other words, there's truth and there's experiences. It's very important to differentiate those two things. A lot of us, we base our lives, we build our lives on our feelings. This is an easy one, especially for those who are empathetic in the room. Do I have any empaths in the room? Right. Online. I'll bet there's a lot of empaths, people who feel deeply. And those who feel deeply base their lives on how they feel. And, and I get it, because there are times, I, I'm a little bit more logical, but there are times when my emotions get stirred up, and I can begin to base something on an experience. In other words, I go to a really, fa- or, or like I have a really fantastic worship experience here. Or, or, or like even if I go to a concert or something, and the experience is amazing, right? And so I ba- that, that feeling wells up. I say, I want to replicate this feeling. Feeling and experiences are very tied together. Or I don't feel like that truth really fits with me. That's cool. But there's objective truth, too. And Jesus would say, there's objective truth, and that's me, right? And, and, and I'm the rock that you build your life on. And then there's how you feel about it. If we build our, and it's okay to feel a certain way. Jesus is, is, is not saying you can't feel a certain way about those things. What he's saying is, is if you base your life on that feeling, it's shaky ground. Because when your feelings betray you, when your feelings, when all of a sudden you don't feel it, or when all of a sudden your feelings go sour, or, right, you can see how it just could collapse, could fall apart. We can also build our lives on what I'm going to call sandcastle faith, okay? This is where you, some of you may not like me very much. That's okay. It's not okay. I keep saying it's okay, but I don't want it to be okay. But I have to say it anyway. But there's sandcastle faith, right? What I mean by that is we have these, these kind of things that we base our, our, our faith journey on that aren't necessarily the rock of Jesus. They're kind of these sandcastles. They seem like they're really solid. They seem like they're maybe really good to follow. But the truth is, is as soon as the waves come, they come crashing down. Because they're not really solid. They're just what we thought looked solid. So sandcastle faith, it can look a lot like, um, well, I'll give you a couple examples. There's probably a lot more examples again, but I'll give you a few that I can see. Um, and, and what this comes from is I see a lot of people right now, there's kind of a movement. Some of you may know this, some of you may not know. I'll give you this information. But there's kind of a movement towards deconstructing faith right now. And there's a lot of people who, who, who are 
who just want, like, I need to deconstruct my faith and find out what my faith is really all about. And now, there, now I will say there is a healthy part of this. There's a healthy part of deconstructing your faith. Because the truth is, is we all kind of get out of the house, right? We, some of us, we went to college or we, we started to gain life experience. And, and some of the stuff that we had in here thought begin to get deconstructed, right? And we start to think about things differently. I get that. That happens. Happened to me too when I, when I started to grow up and get into my 20s. I had to deconstruct some things. And we, we constantly kind of do that when we're thinking critically about stuff. But what I'm talking about is there, are, there, there is a movement of, of people who want to deconstruct all of it, deconstruct faith entirely. And here's what I will say. If your faith is easily deconstructible, you have to ask the question, was it constructed on the right thing to begin with? It, 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 it's the question. If, if I can just deconstruct my faith on a whim, I probably didn't construct it properly to begin with. And so, what does it look like to have sandcastle faith? Well, some of this is like legacy faith, right? What, what do I mean by that? I mean faith that was passed down to you. So, you grew up in a Christian household, and, and, and your grandma was Christian, and your mama was Christian, and so now you're Christian. That's legacy faith. It's just passed down to you. Or perhaps you were made to go to youth group, or perhaps you grew up in the church. I have some friends here, right, that have grown up in the church. And I just grew up in the church, and so it's just the legacy of my life. I'm just automatically Christian because I was raised in it. That's legacy faith. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's sandcastle faith. If your faith is entirely built on the legacy of those who came before you, and you have no real faith of your own, it is not built on rock. It is built on the sand. And as soon as chaos comes, it will collapse. The other one would be cultural Christianity. And what I mean by this is probably different than what you may think, and so I'll define it a little bit differently. I think of pre-postmodern cultural Christianity, okay? So in other words, if you go back to the 80s, I'll call it cultural Christianity. In other words, you're Christian because you're associated with Christians. So you're Christians by association. So if your culture, right, in other words, if you lived in the Bible Belt, you, because you live in the Bible Belt, you're Christian. It's just an automatic association. I call that just cultural Christianity. Um, cultural Christianity can also be based on a set of ideals. So, <clears throat> really good, like Jesus taught some really good things. I don't disagree. He taught some really good things. But cultural Christianity would say, those are great ideals to live by. Those are just, those are great teachings, Jesus. I'm going to put them on my wall, and I'm going to follow them to the best of my ability. I'm going to go to church on Sunday, and then I'm going to live the rest of my life Monday through Saturday. It's just Christian by association. There's no real faith that you didn't build your house on Jesus. You built your house on your association with Christians. That is sandcastle faith. Political Christianity. I'm, I'm not kidding. This is a thing. And most of you know this already because you're kind of disgusted by it by now. But, there, but it is true. There is a political Christianity where it is not based on Christ. It's based on what can benefit you politically or socially. And I'm talking either end of the aisle. There's political Christianity that is, that is Republican right wing. And there is political Christianity that is democratic left wing. It is solely based on what it, how it can help me politically or socially. It is not based on Jesus. It is based on po politics. That is sandcastle Christianity. Then there's comfortable Christianity. And this is probably the worst. 
I don't know. It might not be. But it's one of the worst in my opinion. Because this is Christianity the way you want it to be. So I'll take what I like and I'll throw out the rest. I'll make up my own religion. It'll be sort of Christian. It'll have some elements of Christianity. Jesus' name will be involved in it, but it won't be built on Jesus. It's built on something else. It's much more shaky and shifty. Comfortable Christianity. All of those things are shaky, sandy ground. Disguised as a rock. That's the scary part about it. See, our experiences and our feelings, we can get past those. Because we know those lie to us, right? We know that, yeah, I experienced something and it wasn't totally great. Or my feelings, I know they betray me. All that stuff, we get that. But it's harder when the sand is disguised as a rock. Am I right? When we really, really, really thought we were building on something that was good, but it turns out that was sand. And now our lives are crumbling because of it. Now, I'm going to explain something more about this uh, here in a minute. But, but one thing I want to show you in this is that what you build your life on really boils down to who or what you give authority to. That's really what it, what it boils down to. What they noticed here, and you'll see this, after all that Jesus had taught, and after everything that he said in, in this verse that we just read, in verse 29 it comes down to this thing that they noticed, that he spoke with real authority. Real authority unlike the teachers of the religious law of that day. And this word authority means authorized. He was authorized to say these things. There was something about how he said this and and who he was and his essence as they were listening to, to what he was saying that actually in their mind gave him authorization to say the things that, that he was saying. And so the question is, who are you, who or what are you authorizing to give authority in your life? The question we all have to answer. What are we letting have authority? So part of this authorization is that Jesus could prove with his life, right, this, this real part of it, he could prove with his life and how he lived that what he was saying was true. So as they followed Jesus and watched him do what he was doing, they could see that what he was saying actually came from an authorized place. Like he could say this, I believe this, I fully buy into what you're saying, Jesus, and I can build my life on that. In today's vernacular, you might hear someone say like, I see no lies here, right? They might see that and say, that, that's facts. That's real. I'll follow that. And so, if we could take an introspective look here, I want to know, what have, have, and I, I have to ask myself this question all the time. You are not alone in this. Who am I giving authorization to to speak truth into my life? Who, who am I authorizing to be the truth in my ear? Right? Like, is there a specific author or influencer that no matter what they say, they have your ear? It's possible. Where, where maybe that's, you've given that person authority in your life. And when you give the authority there, you no longer see it critically. You begin to listen and believe everything they're saying. That's what full authorization looks like. And so it may start out as you thinking critically and, and looking at it critically, and then it turns into, yeah, 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 tell me more. Oh, totally. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And even if you don't, you find yourself agreeing. That's, that's the slippery slope 
of giving authorization and giving, giving the authority of someone who gives you truth. So, Jesus has the authorization to, no matter what he says, for us to say, yeah, that's truth. That's what I build my life on. Everything else does not have that kind of authority. You guys, that includes me. That includes me. If, if you always only agree with what I say and never think about it, never even give it a second thought, I'd say you're building some sandcastle faith. And I'm saying that as your pastor. But if, if, you, if you never think about it in terms of, okay, I'm going to take that to Jesus now, then it's sandcastle faith. It's not building your life on the rock who is Jesus. So what or who is authorized to give you truth right now? Just, just think, think through that. Think through that. There's a lot of things. There's news media. There's authors and influencers. There's opinions of someone you care about. There's your own opinions, right? Those are all things that you give authorization to. And who have you trusted? And can that source be trusted? That's the other question we need to ask. So, for those, so once you make this assessment, right? Who am, I giving, who am I authorizing to give me truth? We have to ask, can that source be trusted? Does that source have ulterior motives? Does that source have an agenda? Does that source have an agenda that matches Jesus' agenda? If not, maybe that authority isn't, isn't rightly placed in your life, right? So those are all questions we need to ask. Here's the truth. None of us can escape the rain. None of us can escape the storm. It will come. See, here's what Jesus didn't say. He didn't say, if you build your house on the rock, you're not going to experience any storms in your life. He didn't say, if you, if you build your house on the rock, the wind won't come and beat against the house. He didn't say that. He said, if you build your house on the rock, the rain will torrent, the wind will beat against the house, the storm will come, the flood will rise, but your house won't collapse. That's the difference. The difference is not storm and no storm. That's what we want. See, we want Oh, if I build my house on the rock, I'll be great. My life's going to be wonderful. I'll never have any problems. And if I build my house on the sand, now that's when I'm just going to have problems all the time. We want it to be that easy. The thing is, is that the storm is going to come no matter what. Sorry to tell you that, but it is. And it's going to come, and when it comes... Will your house collapse or will it stay standing? All of that depends on where you've built your house. It does. But you know what the, pro the, the problem is? Is that apparently you won't know what foundation you've built on until the storm comes. So the other thing we want, right, is we want the storm to take it easy on us. Like, hey, uh... I really wish you'd come in just maybe like 15 miles per hour so I can check this, the foundation real quick, you know? Like if I see it leaning a little bit, maybe I can go down and make some adjustments. Here's the problem. The storm doesn't care about you. I know. The storm doesn't care about me. The only thing the storm seeks to do is destroy <laughs> what it hits. And so, once the storm comes, listen to me very closely. Please hear me. I, I, I want you to hear. If you don't hear anything else, I want you to hear this. Once the storm comes, it's already too late. We can't wait for the storm to hit and then make sure that things are good. We got to make sure things are good so that when the storm hits, 
we're built on the right foundation. And that's, that's the thing about the storm, is it just doesn't care. The storm reveals, and I think we're all kind of there. When the storm comes, when the pandemic hit, a lot of us thought, oh, this will be a great learning experience. This will be a great time for me to reevaluate my life. There's not a lot of people I know that reevaluated their life. There's a lot of people I know that, re- that realized where their life was. They, it revealed exactly where we were at. It revealed the cracks in our marriages. It revealed the cracks in our friendships. It revealed the cracks in our nation. It revealed the cracks in our churches. It revealed the cracks in our faith. Because it reveals. That's what the storm does. And so it's important for us to build, to construct our faith on the right thing to begin with so that when the storm comes, our faith is not shaken. Because it's all about our faith. It's not that it won't hurt. It's not that we won't have to maybe fix some things around. Like when the storm comes, no matter what, there's devastation, right? Even if you're built on a good foundation, even if your house is steady and the house is still standing, there's still some boards you might have to put up again. There's still some cleanup you're going to have to do in your yard. Right? There's still some stuff that's like, it's not without its pain. It's still going to, to be painful. But you won't be destroyed in it. You won't collapse in it. Because you've built your life on the solid rock. Who is Jesus? Now look at this. Uh, Jesus goes on in Matthew, and and we're going to wrap up here, but he goes on in Matthew to talk about another rock. And uh, it's in Matthew 16. And and I believe that this is the question we need to answer today. So we're not going to go into all these foundational things today. We're going to do that throughout the next several weeks. But today we need to answer one question. So we, we we, we need to, in other words, Lay the correct first stone. So important. Matthew 16, 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? I'll ask you the same question. Because I've asked me the same question. With all of the things going on, with everything that's happening, with all of the deconstruction, with all of the storms, the number one question and the only question that matters as the cornerstone of our foundation is who do you say Jesus is? How you answer that question is how you live your life. Who is Jesus to you? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, You are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Now, sure, Jesus meant in some regard that he was going to use Peter as a very important uh, asset in building the kingdom, right? So he renames Peter in this moment. He says, you're no longer Simon, now you're Peter, which means rock. And on on this rock, I'm going to build my church. But more important than his name, Jesus was building on the rock the foundation of that statement that that Peter said, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. See, he was building the church on that statement. Not on the person, but on the statement, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Who Jesus is to you is your cornerstone. 
It's the foundational question of your life. I will tell you, I'm, I'm telling you, the foundational question of your life. And the rest of your life will be set on trajectory based on your answer to that question. Now look at this, because what he's using is, is language about a cornerstone. I want to give you the definition of what a cornerstone is real quick. The cornerstone is the first stone set in the construction of a masonry foundation. All other stones will be set in reference to this stone, thus determining the position of the entire structure. When we talk about Jesus, right, 1 Peter 2, 4 says, you are coming to Christ who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. Right? He is the living cornerstone of God's temple. When we're talking about Jesus as the cornerstone, we're talking about Him as the first stone. The first stone in the masonry set. When we're building our life, it's all in reference to that first stone, which is Jesus and who I say He is. So today, I want to ask you, who do you say Jesus is? For, for some of you online, some of you here, you've never confessed on your own. I'm not talking about legacy faith. I'm not talking about comfortable or political or cultural Christianity right now. I'm talking about you and Jesus and who you say Jesus is. Not who everyone else says Jesus is. Not who your grandma says Jesus is. Not who your dad says Jesus is. Not who your best friend says Jesus is. Not who the person who brought you here today says Jesus is. Not the person who invited you online says Jesus is. But who do you say Jesus is? The foundational question of your life. I want us to answer it today. And you might be here today and you might need to make that confession yourself for the first time or online. Make that confession yourself to say Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of of the living God. The one who came and died for my sin raised again to raise me to life. And if that's you today, I just want you to say this. Just say these words. To Him. Not to me. Not to those around you. To Jesus. The one who you're building your life on. You're not building your life on the person next to you. You're not building your life on Rhapsody Church or on any of you're building your life on Jesus, and so you and him I want you to say, Jesus, I trust you with my life. Jesus, I trust you with my life. See, we bought a new canopy in February, and Sarah set it up. Me, me and Sarah put it up, and it was a sunny week. And she said, babe, I need you to set the foundation before the wind comes. And I said, you're absolutely right. And so I did. And uh, the wind came. Let me show you this video. And uh, the storm came. The wind started gusting around. It really, really hit it pretty hard. But it didn't move. Because the sandbags were down, right? The foundation was set. Same storm. Different setting. Who is Jesus to you? Is he a good teacher? Or is he Lord? Is he the object of your affection? Or his, is he just an object of your religion? Is he a source of truth? Or the source of truth? That's a really important one. Is he just a source of truth? Or is he the source? Of truth. Is he your genie in a bottle? 
or is he the one you lay your life down for? So Jesus, I pray today that you would engage our hearts. That we would set the right cornerstone, the right foundational stone. And that's you. Our reference point is you. You are the foundation of our life. We trust you with it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you would uh, stand with us, let's sing together. We hope you enjoyed today's message. Here's a link to some of our other messages. And if you were blessed by today's video, would you go to rhapsodychurch.com, it's in our description, and consider partnering with us. Have a great day.